This episode is sponsored by your family group chat. What group chatter type are you? Are you the oversharer who tells all your loved ones way too much about your intimate life? Or the conspiracy theorist who shares the weird social media thing that you didn't bother to even fully read in the first place? Or the inadvertently passive-aggressive texter who still thinks that the eggplant emoji means food? Or are you like my parents, you're the boomer, who always is sharing scripture quotes in response to every single message. God is good, y'all. He's good. I'm sure one of you fits one of those things I talked about, and God knows I do love my family chat, y'all. I just hope it never gets leaked. Let's just get on with the show. This is the Cumin Bell Show. Welcome, my dear friend, Nancy French. There are hillbillies and there are rednecks. I lived with Sarah Palin in Alaska. This chemo has shoved me into menopause. My body temperature is either Chernobyl or Arctic tundra. Oh, I would have been a great first lady. Come on. I could have styled you from head to toe. You came into my life right when I needed you. So the whole time that he was in Iraq, people died. I lied to Mitt Romney. The lie almost resulted in me killing him and him killing me. Everybody gonna don't write me to Kim's crazy or bipolar or anything. All of that's probably true. We could do hillbilly and redneck true crime with Zach. (laughs) (laughs) My dear friend, Nancy French is on the show this week. Y'all, she is a five-time New York Times bestselling author and a ghostwriter. She's written books with celebrities, politicians, and with yours truly. Uh Uh-huh. My book, she did. Um, Her new memoir is called Ghosted, an American Story. It was just released yesterday. And I'm telling you, do not wait. Go run, go get this book. Um, And she's also got another book coming out next week called The After Party. The woman is prolific with her writing. I'm telling you, so super talented. Um, This woman is a powerhouse. What can I say? I mean, she's a dear friend. I consider one of my best friends, soul sisters. And she's doing all of this writing while in full treatment for cancer. Y'all, welcome my dear friend, Nancy French. Nancy French! Yes, this is amazing. No one's ever made something like that for me. This is, and you should have had it a long time ago, girl. I'm so glad you're here. I cannot wait to tell everybody about you. Oh, thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. Do I have to write books to talk to you though? (laughs) <laughs> it seems like that's what's happening. So we need to get another book. You know, we need to get another book going quickly. But y- I, I know, said, I just, you're too busy. I know. I miss you so much, though. We had so much fun writing your book. Oh my gosh. Nancy, I think, I think we traumatized Nancy a little bit with our family, though. I oh, believe no. that. Just for, Can I just say, like, yeah. I believe that 100%. Yeah. Your no, family's that, a lot. No, was it, I did cry. Do you remember that? I cried after I hung out with your family. We went to lunch <laughs> and we got in the car and you were driving Tell me Tell people back. why. Tell people why. Don't say he's like, oh Lord, Kim, they beat her up or something. There's <laughs> something so beautiful about your family. Um, the way that you guys interact, the the bond that you have, the sort of impertinent way that you interact with each other like it's just such a wealth of love that you can just say anything and you guys being together for that lunch I I think we were together for like a couple of hours at that lunch and I got in the car and I just cried and I said I just think it's beautiful (laughs) I thought it was beautiful it wasn't yeah it wasn't negative it was sweet the thing about it Nancy anybody that comes into our family they immediately get like on Prozac or Lexapro or something (laughs) Xanax yeah So I'm glad you cried. I'm just glad you cried and released and didn't have to be medicated. No, okay, but we're here to talk about you today because remember when we were talking about your memoir? I remember when we were writing uh, Collecting Confidence, um, we would would have these hour-long conversations and... I just I just thought you got me and you saw me. And after hearing a little bit of your story, I know why. I mean, girl... Your memoir is a movie waiting to be made. People Aww. have no idea. Y'all go get this book. How long did it take you to write it? And, and how long has this been on your heart to write this ghosted and American story? Well, you know, Kim, when we wrote your book, I think we did it relatively quickly. Um, we, we did. We oh, had to. We were on a deadline. Yeah. And so we were sort of talking all the time. So I thought that when I got my own book deal that I would just whip it out. And I, but I, I wrote one book. I mean, I have like several of my celebrity clients have had New York Times bestsellers. And one of them I wrote in 24 days. It's like insane. So I thought I could write it really quickly, but it took me forever because 
there's so much drama and challenges and, you know, it's hard to know what to share. It was really hard. I think I pulled it out, but it was hard. When you say it's an American story, you've got to tell everybody, give us, don't give the whole story away, but you've got to give us some nuggets because you have done, you have been through so much trauma in your life. And when I say you are so brave to write it fully, can you give us a little background, Nancy, of yeah. what an American story is? Yeah, my family comes from Monego Mountain, which is in the foothills of the Appalachians. And so I sort of grew up in a hillbilly family, but with, you know, in a, but not on the mountain. So I had the hillbilly sensitivities, but I was, I was raised off the mountain. So I didn't really have that experience. And What's the so, difference? What's the difference? Well, you know, there are hillbillies and there are rednecks. Now, what is a hillbilly? What is a hillbilly? <laughs> Now, listen, a lot of people want to know these definitions because we throw around hillbilly, redneck, all of that, even white trash. I mean, we've thrown that around a little time. So tell right. us what that, that, give us the definition of a hillbilly. Okay. Well, I've been accused of being all three and there's probably <laughs> truth in all of that. But Me too. Me too. <laughs> I bet. And don't forget country bumpkin. Don't forget country bumpkin. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, it's like people underestimate you. But on the mountain, the hillbilly family that I have, they were strong. They had fortitude. They didn't really care what other people thought. So there wasn't any posturing. They just what were what they were. And mm. I differentiate that from like more of the redneck mentality where that's more in your face. It's like, this is what I am and you have to deal with it. <laughs> hillbillies just don't care. And so I sort of grew up you know, in a small rural town. And yeah. I had that. So it was sort of, it is just an interesting upbringing. But in that small rural town, I was abused in the context of church. I got set off on a bad path, Kim. And mm. it resulted in just a lot of bad romantic decisions. And so I sort of talk about all that. Okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Like define romantic decisions. Oh, man. I just dated the wrong guys. Hey, you know that. Okay. Just pause everybody because everybody's right now listening going, oh, yeah, that Steve, I shouldn't have gone out with Brent. I mean, yeah. In fact, we've uh -huh. all got stories there. Mm -hmm. I think I know your list by heart. Let's just move on. <laughs> We're moving on. Now let's dig into I'm, that. Let's dig into <laughs> you know, that. That, that, that is the... <laughs> That is the behind the American story. That's that's that, really the next book for you. Okay. No, but yeah, seriously, have a whole so you may drive on that. Oh Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Making out in the back of a car. Okay. Anyway, so you had a, you when you say abuse, break it down to me what you mean by abuse. Yeah. So I went to Kim. This is yeah, so. Do th it. This is this is why I love you. Okay. Because you. Okay. You came into my life right when I needed you to come into my life mm, because same. I, yeah, because I was at a really low point as real as it relates to church because I was abused by my vacation Bible school teacher. And so, mm. and I loved church so much. I loved going three times a week. I liked the little cookies that you would put on your pinky, you know, in vacation Bible oh, school. The little that had butter, the, the butter. Yeah. Yeah, the little daisy looking butter cookie. Yes. Oh, yeah. So good. I loved that. And I loved the red Kool Aid and the balloons and all that and the songs. Mm. There's some crazy vacation Bible school songs, by by the way. Uh, anyway, but and I then, can sing them verbatim right now for you right now. I know. Yeah. There are some uh -huh. weird ones. Uh, but then when that happened, it sort of separated me from my church community and from God in a lot of ways because mm -hmm. it just sort of, I, I, I was uh, 10 years younger. So I was like 12 and he was like in his 20s. Um, and he was a preacher. And so I, it was just disorienting to me because I really believed the Bible and I thought it was going to H-E double hockey sticks because <laughs> of this activity. Um, but mm -hmm. then when I would go to church, he would be there. So I, I'd have to stand away. And I started becoming one of those people who smokes like clove cigarettes and paints her fingernails black and, you know, sits on the edge of church, you know, church's campus or whatever. And anyway, it just sort of messed me up. Mm, and it of set course. me in a... In Why would it not? Path. How could it not? Yeah. yeah, it was just sort of hard to get back to God in that way. And anyway, I'm still sort of climbing my way back. But that's when I met you. <laughs> because when I met you, Kim Gravel loves her some church. I love church. I love church now. I don't say I love all church people. I know, but but it was nice. Like you're you're yeah. you weren't cynical like I was, or you weren't bitter like I was. And so it was so nice because we would talk for like hours and hours about mm. stuff. And it was just so meaningful to me. You just lifted me when you didn't realize you were. Oh, you did the same for me, Nancy. I mean, you, 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 
you are such a deep well. And I think it is because of your past experiences, because you have dealt with so many different, interesting, wonderful, complicated people. I mean, you've written books for politicians, like name some of the people that you have ghostwrited for in, in, in the yeah. book business. Yeah. Well, I started out with, um, Ann Romney, um, and that one mm-hmm. didn't get published. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because Mitt didn't win in 08, and, so, and she went on to do a different one. And then I lived with Sarah Palin in Alaska. Which oh, is, lo- in Ala- oh, that's fabulous. Oh, it was so crazy and fun. It was like she would make me moose casseroles and, you know, I don't know. Oh. She's it's, yeah, it's you so had me crazy. A, you had me a casserole. Okay, I know. you know. Yeah, no, she was so great. And so I lived with Sarah Palin. I think I did three Palin books, and I've worked with uh, Senator Ben Sass and a bunch oh. of GOP politicians, just a bunch of those guys. But then I also worked with like, uh, I've written some stuff for like Kim Kardashian and Sean Lowe, The Bachelor. And, you know, nothing compares to Kim Gravel, but, you know, I've just I've had some experiences. <laughs> well, well, you know? move over, uh, Kim. There's another <laughs> Kim coming. I'm teasing. No, you have. And the thing about it is, is that, you know, you have to manage people's live stories life stories when you're doing this. What did writing your own, which to personally, I want to say this to everybody. Not everybody can work with Nancy, but I, I really recommend everyone write something about their life story. There was, there was something, do you remember I would fight you on this? I, 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 people, I mean, okay, I'm in front of the TV a lot, and I'm, but I really am not a person that likes to be out front and on stage. It's the weirdest thing. Now, my sister, mm-hmm. honey, she'd beat you with a yardstick or a, b- a baseball bat to get in front of a camera and be all be, all be up about her. There's something that I think is so important for everyone to write their story. Why? What did writing your story down do for you? Well, I don't know if you remember this, but when we first started Collecting Confidence, I said to you this. I said, we are not writing your story God is writing your story. No. And because he writes, he orders the path, uh, the steps of a righteous woman and man. And I just feel like God is writing the story. And so you don't have to feel, so I have a lot of stuff that I'm embarrassed about. Like I mm. didn't behave the way that I should have behaved and I didn't treat people the way I should have treated mm. them. And I made bad romantic decisions and my parents are still alive. So do I need to write this down? So I had to sort of... <laughs> <laughs> grapple with that. You know, like that's actually hard. And so I I just really had to get the shame of it and just mm. move it away because I know that I've done terrible stuff. I'm I'm not writing this so I can go be some sort of moral leader or, you know, whatever. It's just my story and I'm just very thankful to be able to tell it. And so I just sort of moved from shame to gratitude. And I hope that people when they read it, they won't judge me, you know, as much as I judge myself my whole life. I'm almost 50, Kim. I'm like, just now, yeah. I swear to you, the the message of collecting, I'm sorry, I keep talking about your book. The message of collecting. <laughs> We're here to talk about your book, by the way. <laughs> I'm, this is, tells you that I'm really a ghost writer at heart. But the message of your freaking book, mm-hmm. I don't think I got, Kim. I feel like I'm getting it now. What? Yeah, because I, I like, you know, we talk about it. I sort of fake confidence. I've faked confidence my whole life. And then I met you and you're so effervescent with just, you know, this confident love. It's just really Mm. impressive. And I always felt like I was like a few, a few steps behind you on it. And I was trying to catch Mm. up the whole time. Oh my gosh, Nancy. Yeah. And then Mm. now I'm, so I'm, I'm 49. I have Mm -hmm. cancer, very aggressive type Mm. of cancer. And now that I have it, it's like, I feel so thankful (sighs) for myself. You feel confident. You feel confident. Yes. Like I'm bald as an eagle. Uh, well, that's a good, that's a good hairpiece. That's a good wig. You look good and I love it dark, but we'll talk about, you. Talk, I mean, you're looking good too, girl. We'll talk about the cancer in a minute. Okay. What, what, why do you think, listen to me point, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to touch you. Why <laughs> do you think you're confident now? Cause I'm going to tell you something. Once a woman turns or gets close to that 50, I mean, that's when I lost all my weight. I mean, the, it, there's just something about it. Like, you know, the time, the clock is ticking. Um, not that you, not that you're concerned about it. You know what I'm saying? Like, especially you with cancer. I mean, like you said, you're bald as an eagle. What is it about this time in your life that gives you that confidence? 
there's something really beautiful about aging and maturing mm. because mm. I, I feel like I've always tried to present myself until now. And now I Ooh, just, what do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? That's good. I feel like every time that I interacted with people in the past or mo- most of the time that I sort of had a, a self that interacts with other people mm-hmm. and that self like a presentation. Was, A presentation. I was put together. I was trying to convince you that I'm smart. I, you know, I dropped out of college three times. I never graduated. So I feel like maybe I was always like trying to make sure that I use polysyllabic words. So you think I'm smart or (laughs) do my hair. So you think I'm cute. I mean, I did try to do my makeup better because I was going to see you. Your makeup is killer right now. I don't have any eyelashes, by the way. Or nose hair. Uh, or I can hair. send you some. I've got <laughs> fake ones on right now, so I'll send you some. I'm glad you picked up what I was throwing down. I need some. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't know. I just feel very thankful at 50. There's just something, because uh, you're no longer, you know, I've been married for 28 years. And so there's something very beautiful about aging, already being married, not having to press, impress people, not having to be sexy, not having to be as put together. I don't know. There's just something beautiful about aging. I agree. I agree. This show and this community we're building is all about supporting each other. And you can support us and this show by supporting our sponsors. And I have the most amazing sponsor I just love. And I can't wait to tell you about him today because it has really improved my life, my mental health, my physical health. It's called Happy Mammoth. I absolutely love this company because they're dedicated to making women's lives easier and better. (laughs) And that means using only science-based backed ingredients that has been proven to work for women. And they make no compromise when it comes to the quality. All you got to do is go visit happymammoth.com and use promo code KIM, that's K-I-M, for 15% off your first order. Hormone Harmony has been you know, this product that women cannot stop talking about, and they recommend it to all their friends and to other women. It has over 17,000 reviews, and a bottle of Hormone Harmony is sold, listen y'all, every 24 seconds. Hormone Harmony isn't just for menopause, y'all. It's for any women with symptoms of hormonal imbalances, and all of those women can take it. You can take it. So for this limited time, you can get 15% off of your entire first order. Just go to happymammoth.com with the code KIM and check out. That's happymammoth.com with the code K-I-M, KIM, to check out. Get Hormone Harmony today and start feeling like yourself again. I know I did. This episode is sponsored by ZocDoc. ZocDoc is a free app and website where you can search and compare highly rated in-network doctors near you and instantly book your appointment with them online. Seriously, y'all, it's totally free and it only takes a few seconds to search for and book an appointment with a great doctor in your area who takes your insurance. And can I say, I just did it last week and it was the easiest thing. It's so hard to find good doctors, um, but they, like, at your fingertips, you have a list of doctors in your network and in your area. So what are you waiting for? Go to ZocDoc.com slash Kim or download their free app and check it out for yourself. I love telling people about ZocDoc because I use it. I love it. It's so easy. And it is super fast, y'all. When you go to ZocDoc.com slash Kim, you're also supporting our show at the same time that you're supporting your health for free. So it's a win-win, y'all. Find and book a top-rated doctor today. That's ZocDoc, Z-O-C-D-O-C dot com slash Kim, ZocDoc.com slash Kim to find a doctor in your area, fast and free. Tell us one thing that, that's going to shock me about your story when I read your book, because I've got it on pre-order. I, got, I can't wait. One thing that I'm no longer embarrassed about, but it does not reflect well on me, Kim, um, is that one time when I was, after I was doing some uh, ghosting and stuff, we already mentioned the Romneys. One time I lied to Mitt Romney. <laughs> well, he, he's a politician, so I'm sure he's used to it. And the lie almost resulted in me killing him and him killing me. Uh, the, the the question he asked me was, do you know how to ski? 
Oh, yeah, no. Jesus. Kim, you know, if you're from the oh. South, that means it's something different than if you're talking to someone who lives in Utah, right? So I went with a Baptist uh, youth group when I was in seventh grade to Paoli Mm-mm. Peaks, Indiana. And so I had been sk- skiing before. So I answered, yes, I love yes. to ski. I'm really good at skiing. Shut. <laughs> so he and Ann were like, oh, wonderful. Well, we're going to be in Utah tomorrow morning. Just uh, we'll let you know where the house is. We'll tell you where the keys are. Fill the refrigerator. We'll see you in the morning. We'll ski all day. So I go to their house and I'm so happy, right? Because David was deployed oh. at this time. I'm married to David French who had joined the army after 9-11 and was in Iraq at the time. Right. So I was sort of, I don't know, resentful of the fact that I never got to do anything. So I was like, I'm doing this. So I go to their house and I sit with them and I make this joke when Mitt says, so tell me about your skiing. And I said, I'm practically Jean-Claude Keeley because that was the only skier I knew. And Mitt, who had run the 2002 Winter Olympics, said, oh, I know Jean- Jean-Claude. That's great. Okay. So I so the next day, well, Mitt... Gets, when did you start panicking? Well, I, for some reason, Kim, thought that everything would be okay. That because, sounded confident to me, girl. It's delusional. Um, <laughs> but I... I thought I would get to the top of the mountain and like I would look down and I would say, you know, I think I can probably do this. And Bob Costas would like narrate something like she didn't know she could ski until she believed in herself. And so anyway, (laughs) bad things happened. But the whole thing was absolutely insane. And I had no clothes and Mitt had run the 2002 Winter Olympics. So he opens this closet and he's like, I've got... I've got stuff for you and you will never feel more insecure, Kim, than when Mitt Romney is looking you up and down to determine your size. Yeah. 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 So he was like, oh, so I think these eights will work. And, you know, I was probably. Oh, an eight is good. And that, uh, okay. Yeah, he, okay. He but like, that, that's a good, good, good job, Mitt. Good job. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. He was really great. But the, the downside of that, I was dressed in Olympic gear from head to toe with all the rings. And so my lack of skill made me look like a drunk Olympian. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were drunker than Cooter Brown going down them hills, girl. <laughs> yeah. Mistakes were made, Kim. Okay. How bad? Like, was it like physically could have broke many limbs? Okay. I, I shot past the Romney so fast because I didn't know oh, you're please. supposed to like zigzag. How, how are you supposed to know that if you're from Tennessee? <laughs> um, and Mitt was down there. And the only way to stop myself was to take out Mitt Romney. And I took him out. We were in a oh. hall of body parts. Like if the C- if he had actually won the GOP nomination, the Secret Service would have shot me or something. Yeah, you would have been um, you would have been a goner. Yeah, but it was awful. And then afterwards, I was so embarrassed because obviously I couldn't ski and I'd lied the whole time. And so we were standing on the side, and Mitt and Ann were standing there, and we were. I was crying, and Ann was like, "Are you okay?" And I was like, "I'm so sorry. I lied to you because I wanted to hang out." <laughs> And she said, you know, because David was in Iraq, she said, it is quite possible that you are in more physical danger right now than David. (laughs) And so so I was like, okay. And so she was like, I think we should pray because we were very, it was dangerous. And she goes, I think we should pray. And so we stood on the side of the mountain praying that Mm -hmm. God would save me. And he did. So anyway, I just, but it's, but Mitt, I've never spoken to him about this. And I sent him the book for uh, an endorsement and he endorsed it. And he, in the endorsement, he said something like, Nancy French is a person of integrity. And I thought, okay. Thanks, but Mitt. she cannot ski. <laughs> she cannot <laughs> ski. And she will lie to you about it. She will lie to you to be hanging out with you because she can't ski. Okay. So <laughs> Nancy, this is, this is what I, I, I how, how have you, I want to hear how the book ends. Like a lot of people are like, how does the book begin? How do you start? How does this book end? Because you've had, you've had sexual abuse. Um, you have dealt with y- y- betrayal. I'll I'll leave it at that. Yeah. You have been around a lot of high profile people. You that you and David have dealt with like controversy in the media, and now you have. I mean, you had a husband that went off to war. You know, and now you've got this aggressive cancer. What kind of cancer do you have? Okay, so I have triple negative breast cancer, which is super, super aggressive and is already spread to the lymph nodes. So I have like six months of chemo included in that chemo. It's called the Red Devil, which he who is in me is greater than he who is in the Red Devil, Kim. 
Amen. But it is brutal. It's the most brutal form of chemo. So that's what I'm doing right now. So that's I'm I've been bald for a long time, but in this but this is worse. The way that I'm the my current state is more precarious than it has been and then I'll have surgery and radiation. So I've got a long haul. But the I don't think the cancer diagnosis changes anything about the book because the way the book ends and I think this I think people, you know, who have had problems, which is all of us, which is all of us. Yeah. Yeah, it can resonate with this because the way I I just feel loved, you know, and I feel oh, like wow. I end, I end the note on love. And I I feel very very strongly that God directs our paths and that he's sort he of does. in control of, you know, the things that happen. And I don't love the cancer. I just trust God. You know, mm. like I don't feel- How? How, Nancy? There's so many people listening to you right now that what can I say? I don't maybe doubt um, how do you trust when you have the red devil on your back? Do you know what I'm saying? How do you trust that? Well, God how do you trust? Showed, so it's okay to talk about God on the show. I, I, sure, I feel girl, like, I, who are you talking to? You know I me. Know. These people are so used to me. Okay. Okay. Well, I just feel like I keep bringing this up and, and you know, a lot of people. It's your not, story. But, it's, it's, you know, hey, we don't judge yeah. everybody, but this is your story. Well, God has shown up and shown himself to me many, many times in ways mm-hmm. that are incontrovertible. Now, I might not mm-hmm. be able to convince my postman about it, but I know because God has shown up. And you know, Kim, because there are some stories and you haven't told all your stories. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, oh, but, Jesus, take the but, wheel. Yes, but she's, she's, you've had amazing stories about mm-hmm. God showing up and you cannot explain it otherwise. Can't and deny it. You can't. And, um, I just feel very thankful for that. Like I've uh, every time, like with my daughter, I had like a miraculous thing happen with her and with my son. And I, I just, God has shown up in so many interesting ways that, and I write about it and I just decided to write about it, even though I don't understand it. Cause God has also mm. shown up in ways that are super mysterious and weird and baffling and confounding and quite frankly, angering um, mm. in my life. And I, so I feel like I've sort of been wrangling with God my whole life. Oh, and he is so it's like we're sort of like wrestling, I, you know, and and that's been happening. But he's shown me this warmth and this cozy sort of love and affection. And even though I've been so disgruntled with the church, I just have a vice grip on God and, uh, you know, hanging on to Christianity by my fingernails. But I just I just trust God. And that me and that's not that everything will be OK you know, I might kick the bucket with this, but I just trust him. And I'm thankful for everything that I've done. Mm, all right. We got to we gotta talk more about your adoption and, and, and these kind of miraculous stories where you have seen God show up. And if, well, more with that, more with Nancy when we come back, y'all. Come on back. Y'all, what are your springtime goals? I mean, mine is to stay healthy and to keep my weight off and to love my factor meals because they are calorie smart meals and they have helped me so much with my portion control and to support our show um, and to support your own health. And just for our listeners, you get 50% off your first box of Factor Meals and 20% off your next one by visiting factormeals.com slash Kim50 and use code Kim50 at checkout. Listen, Factor Meals are fresh. They're never frozen. They're chef crafted, dietitian approved and ready to eat in just two minutes. And the most important part They taste so good that even my kids steal them from me. Before Factor, when I needed a fast meal, I would hit the drive-thru. Well, not anymore um, because they have popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, um, Protein Plus, Vegan and Veggie. I mean, they're tailored to you and your schedule. And Factor is celebrating Earth Day all month long. So look out for the Earth Month Eats badge on the menu for their lowest carbon footprint meals. Head on over to factormeals.com slash Kim50 and use code Kim50 to get 50% off your first box plus an extra 20 off of your next box. That's code Kim50 at factormeals.com slash Kim50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. Try Factor Meals, get healthy, and give full. They're good, y'all. 
All right, we're back with Nancy French. Y'all, she has written so many books. This is the most one of the most talented people. Nancy, when we were writing my book, um, I remember writing down the big words you would say because I'd have to go <laughs> Google them and look them up. Okay, so like you made me sound intelligent because you are so intelligent. Um, we were talking about before the break how God has just shown up in your life. You've got to tell your story about your adopted daughter who is absolutely... Girlfriend, lock her up now. She is absolutely gorgeous. Can when did she become a woman? She's so pretty. She and her middle She's name gorgeous. is Punji. I know, which means beautiful. <sighs> and her first name is Naomi, which means pleasant. So that's a very <sighs> aspirational name, but she lives up to it. So yeah, so David and I had two blonde hair, blue eyed kids, and we decided for number three that we should adopt. And so <laughs> we really, you know, sort of agonized over that because well, actually, this does not reflect well on me either, Kim, but when David well, brought, hey, keep it real. <laughs> when David brought it up to me, I said, Why why would we adopt? Our kids are behaved, you know, they are making good <laughs> grades, everything is good. We add this extra person, you know, there's no telling what could happen. And uh, you know, we have a great marriage, everything is calm. And David looked at me and he said, Well, what type of family should adopt? Families that don't you know, that have kids that are misbehaving and bad marriages? Yeah. Or do you think that we're... <laughs> <laughs> we did we did good. We, maybe we, we, we could do good again. Yeah. Yeah. And so we decided to adopt. And with trepidation, we went to Ethiopia. That was the fastest, mm. uh, most direct way to adopt at the time. And went there with our hearts full of sort of fear. I was sort of fearful because what would happen when you add a, a stranger to your family, a stranger who's never seen probably a white person before? And mm. uh, anyway, so we go to... Ethiopia. And I, I told the kids before we went down there, I was like, you know, this is going to be hard, but life is short. And, and you, you know, it's, this is what we've decided to do. And this is a, a wonderful thing to do. And, you know, we just need to brace for it. So we get Naomi and she's wonderful. She's amazing. Uh, we've had, you know, a lot, it, it, we've had her for many years and ups and downs, but she's really, really, really a wonderful, flourishing person. But it was very hard at first. And um, you have to go through all of these, uh, this paperwork when you get home. And when we got home, um, David and I were looking through the paperwork and he noticed her birthday. Mm -hmm. And the sweetest thing about that was that that was the night that David was flying into Iraq, which was also a very difficult decision that sure. caused us much trepidation and fear. And on that night, he was in a helicopter behind a gunner looking out. There were fires burning, you know, on, across the land. He was, uh, and he prayed to God on that night that God would sh protect him and show him, you know, that he has a future. And God never answered him. And so the whole time that he was in Iraq, people died. He, when he was in Iraq, his unit suffered more casualties than any other unit. This was at the height of the surge. And David saw genocide. It was awful. And so he never got that assurance from God. You know how sometimes God talks to you and sometimes mm -hmm. he frustratingly does not. So God was not having that. So he, David was like, God, please help me survive this. And he never got any sort of assurance. Also, he saw a million or not a million, but he saw a lot of his friends die who were good Christian people better than, you know, we are. And so it was sort of hard to figure out. So that night when we were sitting there looking at the adoption papers and we saw that Naomi was born on that night where he was asking God to assure him of his safety, that God was preparing a future for our family somewhere mm. in Africa and a continent we'd never been to. But he knew that he had plans for us and he was preparing that for us, even though in his wisdom, he decided not to let us in on that. Sorry, I get emotional. It's so, but it's so true. It's so true because yeah. we don't know what we don't know, but he knows. Right. And you just he ask knows. for stuff. And you sometimes he does and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he heals and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he delivers, sometimes he doesn't. It's so baffling. It's so baffling, but you just I just trust that he's good. Do you know? Uh, yeah, he's good. We don't see it all the time, but he's good. Now, after that, wasn't David vetted to be, to, to, as a possible candidate for the presidency. Yes. Okay, yeah. you've got to, like, okay, not all of us have that opportunity. I mean, I just personally, Zach, don't you want to know, like, what is that like? like yeah, I'm what really is a curious. vetting to be, I mean, like, do y'all have FBI files? I'm just saying, I'm just asking. 
Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So if, d- during 2016, I think it was Bill Crystal tweeted out something about David possibly running for president, which was so terrifying. Okay. okay. Like, he, yeah, terrifying. So we were in New York because I'd taken my kids there to see Hamilton, right? And we we oh, were going to stay Hamilton. a few weeks because I wanted them to see the city before college. And so all of a sudden, report everyone is trying to figure out who David <laughs> French is. Who's this guy? David French, uh, he's wonderful, but he wouldn't have even been my first candidate choice, right? So, uh, or his. I thought you were going to say he wouldn't have been my first choice for my husband either, but here we are. <laughs> right. Yeah, definitely. I, I picked There's well. a story there too. There's a story yeah. there too. Anyway, go ahead. So, and, so get the book, we, people. Get the book. And I didn't mm. have clothes. Like, I didn't dress to be on TV. You know, like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. You and didn't so, know me yet. You didn't know oh, me yet. Okay. You could have helped so much. I could have styled you from head to toe. Oh, I would have been a great first lady. Come on. You, There's still time. Of course. And I'd had you banging, honey, with lashes and everything. Go ahead. <laughs> I need you now. <laughs> so anyway, so it was just terrifying because everybody yeah. was, you know, and I thought, Kim, and this, one of the things is I still hadn't told about my sexual abuse, these right. boyfriends. And I thought yes. that when his name was floated, that the reporters would find that and humiliate me. And they did. They looked through everything, but what they didn't find that, but they found something about our Christianity and our rules about marriage during deployment and stuff. And they just, they made something up like Nancy French is not allowed. David French did not allow Nancy French to use the internet while he was gone. Something like that, that I was subservient. It, it, it didn't make sense. It was just a Politico writer who tweeted that out. And that is so not you either. So. <laughs> No, and also, I didn't care about people calling me subservient. Like, oh, you got me, Politico reporter. You, you found it. Ooh. Because uh, I was nervous about the, you know, my past. And so they, okay. they were like, okay, now it's time to be vetted. Now, David French, who writes for the New York Times now, did not run for president. Uh, but right. he he thought about it for a few days. And during those days, we had to do very cool things, including but not limited to. Reporters found our sort of econo lodging that I got in Manhattan that I got from Airbnb that was super cheap and didn't have a doorman was super hot. And so they found <laughs> us there and I couldn't go back because there were reporters outside the apartment. And so there was, so these people were like, okay, you have to go and find a place to live in New York. And I was like, okay, I definitely want to do that. Cause I love looking at like rich people houses and how rich people live and Manhattan is just full of that. And so I got to go to like three different places and see these like multi-million dollar apartments. Uh, and I loved it so much. I was so happy. Uh, but that was just in case some, in case he ran, we needed a headquarters there. So I was all about that. But, um, but the other the thing that was actually terrifying was sitting down with someone to be vetted where they ask you mm-hmm. everything. Do you have any problems romantically, sexually, um, did, what? Finan- financially? Have you ever fought with your neighbor? You know, stuff like that. And so you, anybody who could come out and embarrass you. So I had to sit down and take a real serious reflection <laughs> on my life. And it was pretty terrifying. <laughs> of course, later I put it all in this book. So I don't know why I was so n- <laughs> nervous about it. <laughs> and can, can I just say... From politically speaking, I think that what you might have done in your past, honey, a lot of people have done a lot worse and have gone on to be have very successful political careers. So yeah, well, you know, my main thing is I was mean. Yeah, does that make sense? Oh. I was just sort of yeah. bitter. I I just was I. I could I, be mean too. I think we all have that. And I and I was not, I was not even menopause going through it and mean. So I mean, girl, you were in good company. <laughs> right, right. But I, you know, I feel like menopause makes you mean. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm very familiar with that. This chemo has shoved me into menopause, I think, because mm. it it catalyzes that. So mm-hmm. I my body temperature is either Chernobyl or Ar- Arctic tundra. It is crazy. Yeah. I mean, you I have feel, a hot flash of two seconds. Right. And it's like mm-hmm. serious. Like I'm sure everybody already knows this, but I, I don't know if it's chemo exactly or if it's menopause or if it's all mixed up, but I am, my body is doing things I never thought it would do. <laughs> Are you, are you, um, you're clearly such a gifted writer and and you're prolific in that, like, it just comes through you. I don't even think it's you, right? I think it just comes through you. And I say that in the book, like your purpose and your calling in life. And I, you know, I've had mixed emotions. A lot of people said, I don't believe we have a calling and people like, 
Um, they're dead wrong, first of all. I mean, why would God give us such gifts and talents in certain areas if he did not want us to use it um, to benefit everybody else, to the glory of who he is? You know, and writing is that way for you. It just comes through you so easily. Have you been validated in that? Or is, are, is it, do you know what I'm saying? Like, do you believe that to your core, Nancy? Do you take it you for know, granted? No, I'm so thankful. I didn't, I, I never learned how to do stuff. Like I, I sort of, I, I'm an autodidact. I, I've taught myself because mm-hmm. I never graduated from college. I have some learning issues and um, I just, I'm a sto- I love telling stories and the fact that I get to do it, I've never ever going to take that for granted. Mm. And people frequently are like, oh, ghostwriting is so like low, low in the totem pole. In terms oh my of God. No, it is not. It's so sacred to be able to hold someone's story, you know? And, and also Kim, honestly, you know, I love you. We have spent so much time mm-hmm. together mm-hmm. and I feel like it's such a sacred opportunity. Mm-hmm. Friendship. To con- yeah, Sisterhood. To connect- yeah. Yeah. And to also it's, it's, it's the story of what God has done. You know, so like when you're writing a story, if you tell it honestly, it's what God has done. And that's what I tried Mm -hmm. to do in Ghosted instead of trying to like make myself look better. It's like, this is, this is my level of, you know, whatever. And, but God has been faithful. I've been unfaithful. God is faithful. I've messed Mm. up. God hasn't messed up. And it's just beautiful. I just, I just love it. I'm so thankful to be able to write. I would write, I used to answer ads for Craigslist. For fifty dollars, and that—that's how I started. And they never paid Kim. I would write all no, this stuff. They I, probably I didn't, didn't even pay. No, I didn't know. But anyway, so I'm, every time I get paid a dime, I think about that Craigslist thing, and I'm so mm-hmm. so thankful. So, so all right, Nancy. Let me ask you this: What would you say to someone who's listening to this right now that is in your shoes, whether they're dealing with trauma or cancer or they're approaching 50 or in their 50s that have a dream and they know there's something inside of them. Maybe it's very, maybe it's hidden. Maybe they've never said anything to anybody. Maybe they've never spoke it out. What would you say to that person that might think it's too late or they can't move forward in it? You know, someone who's doubting. You know, I think there's a part of them still that exist that hopes and dreams Mm. and frequently another part of them moves in to manage that like oh no 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 you can't think that you can't dream that we're we're you were disappointed before you don't want to be disappointed again so you sort of manage your fears you manage your expectations and you try to protect yourself from getting hurt and there's something very beautiful about just sort of being willing to be hurt being willing to be vulnerable, mm. being willing to be sort of like less than what you think you are um, and just pursuing it with a hopeful sort of confidence that even if, you know, because I've, I've done so many things that haven't worked out. I've, I've written three novels. I couldn't give them away. I couldn't get any publisher to look at them. So it's not necessarily that you will succeed, but that you will you will definitely succeed in your eff- in your efforts because it does something for you. And who knows what will happen, you know, like who knows what will, if this book will sell or whatever, but I did it. And I'm so thankful with the cancer diagnosis to have it written down and to be able to record it with my own voice so that my kids mm-hmm. can have it. So anyway, I just feel thankful for that. But I just want people to like, it's not, I want people to acknowledge the, the different voices that they hear. So some people will say a part of me wants to do this mm-hmm. thing and do or be artistic. I mean, part of me thinks that I'm too afraid to do that and just differentiate between those two parts. And when you do that, it's like you're sort of separating them out and you can sort of talk to yourself like David did in the Bible where he says, you know, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Who mm. is he talking to? You know, he's talking to himself. To himself. So you can, yeah. And you, you do that. You do a lot of healthy self-talk. Mm-hmm. And I think we could do that. And it's not to Uh, disparage the part of you that doesn't want to get hurt because that part of you is important and beautiful too. And it's only trying to protect you, Mm. but you can acknowledge that that part doesn't have to do that. Now you can say, okay, I'm 50 or I'm 60 or I'm 70. I don't have to worry about being ostracized in the sixth grade, you know, lunch (laughs) cafeteria anymore. I can just do what I want. And also like, I I love how you say you're speaking to the, I used to think I was like, I think I've told you this before that am I schizophrenic? Like, I've actually said, because I will, there's, I mean, I go like, 
go to this. And I, don't know. I mean, I go back and forth and I'll talk to myself and I can, it's almost like, it's like I'm going outside of myself, listening to myself, talk to another part of myself. It's the, yeah. and I, now everybody going to don't write me that Kim's crazy or bipolar <laughs> or anything. All of that's probably true, but I'm just saying like, when you say we're talking, we, we have so many voices that come at us, mm-hmm. especially if we've experienced trauma, especially in who hasn't, right? In different ways. Right. In pain is pain. I don't care right. what that has been for you. So how have you taken your pain and used it to help other people? I think this book is going to be that. So everybody needs to get the book because I think it's going to bless you and really help you Um you know, with the things that you've dealt with in your life, but because if I know Nancy, it will do that. But what what do you hope that people get from this, Nancy? You know, I think because I was the victim of sexual abuse, I never wanted to talk about it, hear mm-hmm. about it, or think about it. But when I was doing your book, um, I started working on an investigation to help other people who had been abused. Mm-hmm. And that was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. I felt it almost killed me, to be completely honest. I know you. I bawled on the phone with you more than once. Well, because um, the but, outcome was not what it should have been. Yeah, I proved everything and nobody really cared. Uh, the church had a collective yawn, Kim. That's why I, I get know. so upset. I know. Yeah. So anyway, um, but I want people to really, and this sort of ties back to the the, if you're trying to dream of what to do with your life. I want people to realize that it doesn't matter what the outcome is because you are responsible for your actions and God is responsible for what happens with that, the consequences. And so that's very liberating. That means that you don't have to worry about checking off the boxes like, okay, I did this investigation and the camp was shut down or the church did this or whatever. You don't have to do any of that. You're just, I know that I do not exact justice on earth. I don't have that sort Mm. of power. And so I'm just sort of standing here with a sign on the side of the road and saying, hey, guys, justice is important. Hey, guys, we should protect children. Hey, guys, love is important. Hey, guys. And it's I'm pointing to a future day when all things will be made right and the tears Mm. will be dried. And so I'm just I just consider myself a road sign like, okay, one Mm. day this is this is coming. It may not be today in spite of my best efforts. But this is coming. And so a lot of these people who are listening, you guys, you know, you're dreaming, you're thinking, you know, what can I do? I think it's just very wonderful to serve people and to Mm. pour everything into that because that is not going to come back to you without some, like, that's just a beautiful thing that's transformational. So for the past maybe three years, I've been doing investigative journalism, which has been so frustrating and terrifying and, uh, difficult, but it's the most important thing I've ever done. You know, I think, I think that's why like, cause I am a, you know me, I love the crime stories. You know, I love that. Yes. I love a good like ghost story, like a murder, you know, like a um, haunting thing. And I also love the crime stories. And you know, that's, that's like so big for women our age. I mean, women our age, like, and I think it's because like, we do want to see justice. We do, we do want to see right be right, you know, and, and I do believe, and I'm going I'm to do a big swing around here. I do believe that when people don't operate in their purpose and their calling in life, um, it opens up uh, messes to happen. I know that seems like a big stretch. Like me doing my calling is the reason people, you know, are, are not doing the right thing, but kind of so, right. Cause like if people would just operate and really, be almost selfish in their pursuit of what they're called to do on this earth. We'd stay out of everybody else's business, if nothing else. Right. I know. That's exactly right. (laughs) And it gives you so much, and there's so much good things to be done. It really keeps Mm -hmm. you busy, too. You know, like I've been doing almost nothing else for three years, but... Um, and I'm thankful, even though, and I, I I think that's something very important where you just do stuff without fearing failure. Correct. You know what? I think I've just had an idea. I think you and I, our next book and then a series should be about a true crime podcast. We would kill that. Oh. <laughs> no no pun intended. No pun intended. <laughs> 100% pun kill? intended. Zach, are you, are you available for I mean, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. No, listen, do it. Okay. Listen, I got, we do something every time we have a podcast. We do rapid fire questions. Now, look. Oh, gosh. I know. 
I'm going to give him my little speech because right. even, I mean, I've had celebrities on here that can talk the hair off a monkey's butt. I mean, I've got people that can talk. And every time I do this, like, oh, and I'm like, no, it's called rapid fire. Fast. Don't let me down, Nancy. I'll do, do it. Do not let me down. Okay, but don't You're judge wordsmith. me. No judgment, but I'm counting on you. Okay. Okay. So this is the fill in the blank. So I'm going to be okay. like, my name is, and then you fill in the blank. Okay. okay. Here we go. You ready? Rapid fire questions. My first impression of Kim Gravel was? Uh, redneck, hillbilly, just like me. Yay! <laughs> oh my God, that's the biggest compliment. <laughs> I told you, I told you, Zach, Nancy wasn't going to let us down. The strangest (laughs) request I've ever received from a client was? To be interviewed uh, nude. Are you serious right now? Yeah, I wasn't nude. The client was. I won't tell you which one. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. is it Kim Gravel? Was it Kim? Was it Kim? I think it was Kim. (laughs) It sounds like Kim. (laughs) Although, Kim, you have said in the past, and I quote, we're a naked family. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, my family's a naked family. <laughs> we are. Like, everybody's naked. I mean, all the time. Like, there's no modesty at all. All right. And let me just tell y'all, it's not weird either, so please don't write me, because I'm going to delete them anyway. <laughs> That's really okay. Funny. Well, when you look good, you got to show it. Well, we don't look good. I mean, Lord, I, y'all, this is a true story. I got to tell you, you might want to cut this out, Zach, but Travis said to me the other day, like, he's watching Naked and Afraid on TV. The best. <laughs> yes. It's amazing. Yeah. So he said to me, he said, Kim, should I go on Naked and Afraid? I said, dude, you'd win. You would win Naked and Afraid. It's a fantastic show. I wish they had money he, attached to it. But I'm just going to tell you right now, he's not a, He's not good. You know, there's good Naked and Bad Naked, and I'm just going to be honest with you, Travis. You wouldn't tune in for the body, but for the brain. Here we go. <laughs> the one word my high school teachers would have used to describe me is disobedient and disrespectful. Oh, that's two words. That's two words. Sorry. Mm-hmm. I, but my, I got kicked out of my English class because they said that I was. For what? Um, they said that I, that my teacher, I think maybe struggled a little bit. I think she later. <laughs> yeah. But she removed me from her class. Struggled with what? Struggled with what, Nancy? She was Woo! sort of, she was sort of mean. And she, for some reason she'd picked on me. Like she picked me to be a target of her, uh, angst. Uh, and she could, she told the principal, I cannot, pr- I cannot teach this person. She's such a terrible writer. She even told me that she could tell that I was an idiot because my handwriting was loopy. And she told me that scientists have shown that the people with handwriting like mine were ignorant. I swear to you, I probably am a writer today because Linda <laughs> at Henry County High School. Uh, Linda, honey, we love you, honey, but you missed the mark on that one. Listen, can I tell you something? I want to, this is a tidbit and a trick. I'm, I'm starting to do this little series of like tips and tricks. Everybody wants to know tips and tricks, but I, this is one of them. I'm so glad you said this because whatever you were put down, made fun of, or told you can't do, nine times out of 10 is the thing you should do. Right. It's the weirdest thing. I I think that is like, people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Well, what'd you get made fun of when you were young? That's probably the thing you need to be doing. I know. It's almost like Satan was trying to undermine you and you yeah. have to just have fortitude. Yeah. Well, but that's what I'm saying. Like, if you know that, like, I, you know, I've taught my kids that. I'm like, oh, if they making fun of you, that that's the one thing that you, that's that's the good thing about you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I love oh. that. All right, Linda. Her name was Linda. Listen, Linda. And here we go. Here we go. Um, the movie I always stop to watch when it's on TV is? Notting Hill. Oh, God, the blue door. The so, flipping blue door. So, He's hot. Oh, it's such an amazing movie. It's so good. It's Hugh Grant, right? That's it. That's right. who's in it, right? Mm-hmm. He's hot. Yeah. And he had those okay. little goggles, you know, those swim goggles when he was watching the movie. And Julia Roberts was so pretty. It's so romantic. I, love I know. It. And he has great hair. Oh, I mean, they had good, like, like side characters, too. Yes. And anything British, to me, sounds, like, more intelligent for some reason. Definitely. It's definitely yeah. funnier and smarter. Yeah. Right now, I'm obsessed with blank. Robert... Olin Butler's book called Hell, which is crazy. I just read it. He won a Pulitzer for a different book. I just finished it. It was so good, Kim. It was the story of a reporter who goes to Uh hell and everybody's in hell. Like everybody from Bill Clinton to JFK (laughs) to Mother (laughs) Teresa to Christopher Hitchens. Oh my gosh. So he has to go and interview people for one segment repeatedly for eternity, which was, now, why do you think you're here? (laughs) <laughs> it was just this beautiful book. I thought it was sort of like, I was sort of irritated because like some of my 
you know, politicians that I like ended up in hell in this book. But it, it was a beautiful reflection on mortality and the depravity mm. of man and love, mm. you know, mm. and, and it, it was just, it's just really beautiful. I loved it. And what an interesting, is it got a lot of big words? Am I going to be able to get through it? <laughs> you might, it may be a few big words, but you might okay. like it. I'll yeah. get my thesaurus or dictionary or whatever out <laughs> right now, because I don't even think that thesaurus is what we need to be using. Anyway, listen, I remember, I come from Hillbilly Redneck. Here we go. The skill I wish I had is... Piano playing. Oh, good... mm, right? Did you take mm-hmm. lessons? Yes. And, you know, you don't care about them when you have the lessons. You hate and them. Tra- and, Kim, I actually am doing this mathematical calculation because if I, okay, I'm almost 50. How long mm-hmm. would it take me to get good at piano playing? And am I too old to try is exactly what you were saying. Like, you know, because I'm doing so much stuff. So I'm writing and I'm also doing art, mm-hmm. like visual Your art. Your art is gorgeous. I want you to Thank draw you. me something. We have to talk about that offline. Okay. But do you um, know what I mean? So I, I feel like I might have missed out on my piano playing opportunities. You're not too old to try. I think you might be too old to be proficient. Yeah. And they're so, pianos are so, are so expensive. And I, I'm just like, I don't know <laughs> if I want to sink into this. I, I think I'm just going to get your little keyboard. Lost. A little yeah. dun, 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 I think proficient. Okay. You could be proficient. Come on. I don't think that's, so. No. 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 I just want to play. Decent. I want to play Zach and have Kim Grimmel yeah. sing. You need to play your piano well, so it does it for you, and you just sit there that's and right. you like pretend. Now that that's I'm all need. for faking it. I'm all for yeah. faking it. I yeah. do need that. Those are sort of expensive, but I, I do need that. Maybe if the book sells. <laughs> yeah, I think it's going to sell. I think you're going to have. But I think a piano might be the last on your list of things you're going to get. Here we go. If I started my own church, it would be called the Church of the Blank. Uh, the church of the of the overlooked. Mm. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, because I just feel like the the people. And in fact, the Robert Owen uh, Butler book about hell had all of our presidents, all of the religious leaders, because they had power, right? And so, mm. with my investigation into the the camp in Missouri that uh, had sexual abuse. I've noticed that anyone who has power when it's mixed with churches, mm-hmm. it sometimes it just has terrible results. And I am just, I feel so overlooked and betrayed by my church community. And I love all sure. you guys and I love, you know, God and everything, but I just, it's just very hard. So it'd be nice to have a church where the overlooked people could sort of just gather without being bitter and just sort of, you know, in, encounter God. I know. I know, but girl, Nancy, so many people feel the way you feel. Like, I'm going to tell you right now, that's going to resonate. I mean, I will tell, well, that's a whole nother podcast, but that one thing that you just said right there, the overlooked, that is the church. Don't make me have to get up and preach now. Somebody call me. Okay, here we go. The hardest thing I've ever had to say to someone was... So confessing, saying that you've done bad things and that you're sorry. And there, and I've done, I've had been, ever since I've gotten older, I've just tried to like, because when you're a victim of sexual abuse, you are forced into lies immediately because you've, immediately. I mean, not, not necessarily no, there's some it. people, but you've got this preacher saying, oh, you can't tell anybody about this. And so you start covering up stuff and you start covering up stuff. So you become deceptive. And I was deceptive. And so my whole, and you know, my whole thing was a, I was trying to present myself in a way that I wasn't. And so I think the hardest thing I've ever had to do was sort of come clean about my past, you know, which mm. I've now done. It, in this it's freeing. Book. Yes, it's but, freeing. I had, but I had to go to my parents' house before this book came out because they didn't even know I was writing it, Kim, and oh, get permission from them. I, I, not permission, their blessing because mm. I, and I'd already written it. And I, but I was so terrified to talk to them because I love them so much. And I had to go into their apartment, their house and say, I've written this book. There's some hard things in it. It tells the truth. And I want your actual blessing. And so, and I said, and the following things are included, the abuse, this, this, this. And Kim, I felt so gratified. I had dreaded this conversation Mm. for a year I had never talked to my parents about my abuse other than when they found out about it a long time ago. And I'd always felt sort of sketchy about the fact that they didn't act. 
Yeah. And so when I talked to my parents about it in that wonderful conversation, my dad shared with me just all these, his heart. He was like, I, he apologized. Mm. He, um, he told me stuff that changed the way I felt about how he approached it because I understood his trauma more. Wow. And on top of that, he's 83. When I, when he, I left his house, he said that he heard a sermon about being a better father a year ago. And every night he's been praying about how to be a better father to me. He's in his 80s. He's yeah, praying. it's never too late. And it's never too late. God works. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that moment that I had with them was like parting of the Red Sea miraculous mm -hmm. because I felt like I laid down a burden that was like 10,000 pounds because mm -hmm. I connected with my parents. They gave me the blessing for this freaking book. I never would have asked them if I hadn't written it. He gave you permission to lay down the burden. Y'all, what burden are you needing to lay down? That's a word. I have an irrational fear of blank. Nougat. I hate nougat. Even saying <laughs> like, it makes... Oh, my God. <laughs> no, it's, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. That is the best <laughs> rapid fire question answer I have ever heard in... <laughs> My entire life. Okay, define nougat for those who are like going, what the what? I mean, I, I get it. I okay, get it. Snickers has nougat and it's, it's I don't okay. Know, it's the like nougat this, is not, it's not the caramel. Nougat's not, okay. No. It's like that yeah, tan what is stuff. Nougat? Let me see. It looks like flesh. Oh, I just, I hate it so much. Oh God, much. now you're making me want to gag. Okay. And I hate the I word. I love nougat. I hate the word moist. I hate the word moist. <laughs> and so you hate the word. <laughs> Okay, uh, nougat is made with sugar or honey that's cooked and whipped with eggs to like make it airy. That's what nougat is. Yeah, we don't yeah. need that. Nougat is yeah. like three musketeers, the fluffy stuff mm. inside of three musketeers. Oh, she can't yeah. do nougat. No. That's okay. so irrational. Why? I love it. Yeah. I don't know. It can make my my butt big, Zach. <laughs> that's legitimate. <laughs> That's a good excuse. I like it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Well, we're going to keep this going because this is great. My favorite junk food is chocolate and peanut butter, any combination. Like Little Reese's. Reese's. But I have a great New York Times recipe for uh, those cups. They're so good with <sighs> chocolate with the peanut butter. I put a little, anyway, it's so good. They're so easy to make. Oh, give me that recipe. I will. <laughs> okay. Okay. My celebrity crush is. Ooh. Mm, make it good too. Don't give me somebody really smart. I want somebody hot. Oh, not that you can't be smart and hot at the same time. Wow. <laughs> that can't, oh my gosh. Don't judge me for that. Oh, okay. Oh, well, I don't think you're going to think he's hot, but I oh, love I Brian. don't care. I love my favorite actor in the world is Brian Cranston, and I got to see him in a play in New York, and he is so amazing. I would watch him. Let me him look do him up. I don't, I don't even know hot. who that is. Do I know who that is? Breaking Brad. Did you not watch hot. Breaking? What? Kim, he was on Malcolm in the Middle. Oh, yeah. You know Brian Cranston. Yeah. You think he's, I mean, I would say he's like interesting. Well, he's interesting. But like, you I think, don't know. I don't know if he's hot, but that's, that's. Like, I, Jason Momoa is hot, right? Like, oh, Brad right. Pitt is hot. Oh, that's, it's, Jason hey. Mom it's Jason Momoa and Aquaman. Yeah, good okay, Lord, honey. Under the sea, it. honey. Get me. I want to be Little Mermaid, okay? <laughs> My next book will be about. Blank. I don't know if I'll write about cancer or not, um, but mm -hmm. I, I feel, I don't know. I don't even have like this burning desire to write anything. I'm, I like investigating. I sort of love this true crime stuff. So I'm doing projects on that. I love it too. That. Yeah. Don't yeah. you love that? Yeah. Well, we got to get ready for our podcast. I think true crime with, uh, no, what, how, what we name it? Hillbilly and redneck true crime. People watch <laughs> that. Which one are you? You're the redneck. I'm the redneck. You can be the oh, hillbilly. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I like hey, it. Hey, we could do hillbilly and redneck true crime with Zach. <laughs> <laughs> Zach, you have to be the white I feel trash. like that makes me sound like I am the redneck. He's a New Yorker, hillbilly. honey. I'm, He's a New uh, Yorker. Yeah, I'm a northerner. I don't get called redneck. I get called a lot no, of other No, they stuff. don't. Yeah. They don't. Yeah, I get no, you don't get called stuff. anything. Zach is like one of the one of the good ones out there. I'm telling you. He's one of the oh, good ones. So I'm just, hey, you, get out of the way. That's it. I love That's it. What, yeah. But no, I say this all the time. New Yorkers and Southerners are very similar. It's We just had to bless your heart. We're direct too, but you, we just had to bless your heart. Y'all just say, hey, what do you want? That's yeah. right. Yeah, that's right. All right, everybody. Y'all got to go pick up Nancy's book. 
ghosted an American story. When I tell you, Nancy, I think it's going to be a New York Times bestseller, my friend. I really oh, do. I hope it is. I, I'm thankful. It, I'm thankful to have written it. And I, I just hope it resonates with other people who feel politically, spiritually, culturally homeless in these weird times. I think there's more mm. of us than we think. Oh, I think it's the majority of us. And it's available everywhere books and audiobooks are sold. You can find Nancy on her website, nancyfrench.com. And you can follow her on Twitter, or we call it now X at Nancy. A French or on Instagram and threads at Nancy Jane French. I love you, sis. Thank you for being here. You have to come back when the next book is out. All right. We're going to do a podcast and a million more books. We just have to keep hanging out. We have to keep hanging out. And um, I do have an idea for a book that I want to talk to you about. All right. So tell me when you're free. Tell me when you're free. (laughs) <laughs> I look forward uh, to it And your book is coming out next So we can't do a podcast that soon Because we've already just done this one But we're, about five weeks you got to be back, okay? <laughs> okay, sounds good <laughs> right. We need another All book right. Yeah, because okay. you're writing books We need another book <laughs> yeah. Sounds great All Thank right, you bye, for having Nancy. me I love you Mwah. I love you, Kim I love bye, you Nancy. more Bye, Nancy Thank you Bye Okay, y'all I have another listener Rapid fire question this week I mean, here it is and this is a good one. I love this. What is the petty fight you have over and over with your spouse? Oh, I've got a good one for this sack. And are you right? Okay. <laughs> Put your answer in the comments or send me your answer by connecting with me on my website, Um, it, This is going to be a fun one. I can't what's, wait to hear what's all your answer? Wait, what's your answer, Kim? Yeah, before... Should I give it now? Answer? I guess I'll give it now. So our petty fight is... Do or do you not flush the toilet after you go number one? <laughs> Travis does not want to flush the toilet to conserve water. I'm like, flush it regardless. You got to And we have that water. fight over and over. <laughs> got to conserve water. Oh my God. Okay, y'all, I want to hear yours. Kim, haven't okay? you heard, if it's yellow, let it no. mellow? <laughs> yes, I've heard it. And if it mellows, it mellows throughout the whole entire house. <laughs> so you walk in and it smells like pee. You know what? No, you know, no, too much asparagus in the Gravel house. I think that's oh it. Oh my God. That's, <laughs> it's getting gross. Okay. Jesus, <laughs> take the wheel. Okay. All right. Uh, now, before we go, I have another listener voicemail this week from a woman who realized she needs to shift her own perception. Yes. Um, but that segment is only for the newsletter subscribers. So you're not going to hear it right now. You got to go and subscribe to the newsletter. My newsletter is free and it's the best way to get exclusive show content. So if you want to hear these wonderful extras that go on behind the scenes at the Kim Gravel Show, go to kimgravelshow.com and sign up. Her new memoir is called Something Happens Act. Sorry, that yeah. was me. Yeah. Let me start right. over. You want to start, start over? over? I'm sorry, Nancy. Yeah. That was, I, no I hit the wrong button. All right, ready? Give me my Go. music, boo-boo. I, I got you, boo. Oh, can I show you what I look like with this? I do. I, I want, want to see it because you're absolutely gorgeous. Okay. And I've got a good wig I want to send you to. Nancy knows a lot more about all these politicians than we know, which you really shouldn't talk about all that because you might come up missing one of these days with all these people. <laughs> if you like this episode, here's another one I think you're going to love. Zach, how long am I going to have to point at this? Is this enough?